See what B. Lee Rose Amador, and this is Native Voice TV. We have a special for you this evening. It's a one-hour special, and the reason we're taking the time because it's a very, very important subject. A lot of you are getting ready for the holidays and preparing your for your un-Thanksgiving because we can't celebrate. Um, but you know, there's other people who are struggling to get through these holidays because it's not easy for everyone. And our guest this evening is Richard Winfeathers Muniz. He and his family survived a very horrible tragedy, the loss of their son, a homicide that other Native people have also experienced. And we're here to talk to Richard, find out what he has lived through, what his family has lived through, the struggle they have had and how they survived it and how they're going on. Welcome, Richard. Thank you for coming all the way from Stockton to tell us your story. Thank you, Rose, for, for having me in. Of course, you know, my family is very grateful for, uh, for taking the time to share a little bit about Jerome. And uh, uh, they're grateful that uh, there's uh, voices that, that can be heard and, and uh, those who have gone even after us, you know. Uh, so, or even before us, you know, in a really good sense because of drum speaks sometimes through me and so I'm just grateful to be here. Well, I'm sure um, he's here with us. Now, one of the reasons we wanted to talk about this today is that Native people oftentimes don't get the same publicity, get the same um, help that they deserve and should get because a lot of times our voices aren't that important to other people. And did you, did you fit, experience this in your case? I think right off the bat, uh, Rose, there's, um, there's so much that's determined by media that uh, becomes a category or stereotype of what's high profile and what's profile. Mm -hmm. And again, what's uh, you know not profiled at all because uh, most of the time in cold cases or cases that have uh, uh, happen in families where families happen to deal with, uh, and, and certainly homicide is a an issue that uh, uh, people feel very terrible about. At the same time, families are faced with with um, a tragedy in their lives, mm -hmm. losing a loved one, and whether the age is being young as a child or or an elderly. Uh, it, it ranges from so many different types of incidents, and and, and a lot of times. Uh, I think the media doesn't know what really is, um, you know, to determine what sells the, their product, you know, in a mm -hmm. sense, because we become a product. Uh, victims, victimization is becoming more of that term now, saying, is, is this uh, something we can, you know, find a way to make something, you know, uh, some money. And so a lot of times it's by story, books, movies and stuff. And if you're high profile, you're going to get that. But our Native families are struggling with a uh, non-opportunity um, uh, uh, of getting their voices heard. So from the ranges of uh, different, and sharing with you what homicide is, and a lot of times it's not just uh, as some of our audience might think, it's just something that happens by you know, the use of a weapon, gun. It comes in various forms and sometimes through domestic violence or it comes through uh, um, uh, terms of uh, the elderly, you know, being home invasions and, mm -hmm. and people taking advantage of them uh, situations. So homicide is, is ultimately the, the worst part about it because, uh, uh, and in some of our audience may not understand homicide, but murder. Murder is uh, usually the term, especially for the young folks. Mm -hmm. You know, murder is, is, is happening rapidly. And for our, our, our native, uh, folks, um, uh, we're finding a lot of that happening more and more and more, and uh, just it just seems to me that uh, again the profiling, uh, segregation, or maybe just totally ignoring our native folks has has been the seem mm -hmm. to practice lately. 
Because there's a high percentage, you said, yes. from your research. Sure. Uh, uh, when we talk about so many of them, I mean, uh, it's not just a few from your town or your, your area. It's nationwide, and it's mm -hmm. growing. Uh, recently, I've got 19% just in the state of California of all homicides are Native American, young wow. men, women, and children. And they're unsolved. And so, you know, we, we look for the advocate groups to help out or find some resources to see what we can do to, to bring to light uh, some justice for them. Right. And it just seems like, again, the interest from the DA's office or the interest from the, the victim's witness programs uh, statewide or even the governor himself doesn't find a need or a resolve in trying to, you know, bring some justice for the families. And some closure. Richard, can you tell me about your tribe and then tell me about your family? Sure. Uh, we, we come from our descendants of the Pickerish natives and which are cultured in with the Taos Pueblo Indians out mm -hmm. of uh, uh, New Mexico and uh, our res is the Isleta Reservation. We are um, artists, uh, we have um, um, uh, musicians and certainly pottery makers and, and we come from very proud people. And uh, it's just been a, a trait that we can share with people. We come from the Chimayo and the Pinasco area there in northern uh, uh, New Mexico, and the language spoken is the northern Tiawa. So we're, we're very proud people from over there in the Midwest. Hmm. And you have how many children? You, you and your wife have? Uh, Geraldine and I, uh, we are a joint family. Uh, when we first got together, she had her two and I had my three, so it was similar to, uh, you know, I remember a television show and yours, mine and ours, so well, that's what we became. Uh-huh. And you, your family was raised in Stockton? Uh, not really. I think we came from the Bay Area okay. due to circumstances of, um, as I was employed with the Department of Defense and mm -hmm. base clo closures happened. We relocated uh, early in uh, uh, 1994 into the Stockton, uh, San Joaquin area. And so we raised the children from there into mm -hmm. the school districts and uh, involved them in the programming out there. Now your son, Jerome. 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 Tell us about Jerome, and I hate to bring you through this whole situation again, but he didn't come home one day and, or was late, or what happened? Well, you know, uh, as most, and I hope our audience can understand, you know, teenagers uh, will be teenagers. And so keep in mind, and, and, and as I'm going through this, this is something that, again, at the very beginning, when your child doesn't come home, uh, you know, you, you worry at first, uh, more or less, or maybe he's over a friend's mm -hmm. house, or he's just a little late, and things maybe get a little bit, he's late for dinner, so we, we need to start, you know, calling and seeing where Jerome might be, so. And you mentioned your musicians, sure. your family, and he sure. was a musician with you? Yes, he, yes he was. He played with us in the uh, churches uh, for seven years with uh, his other siblings. Uh, Josh, Nate, and, uh, and Jay, and uh, Ty played with me when we, mm -hmm. we played together as a family, and we had united with another family, so it was mm -hmm. Marvin's three and my three, and mm -hmm. we became, uh, the Christian Worship Center team out there, and we played for many, many moons with, uh, with the uh, churches out there. Uh -huh. So he uh, didn't come home, and you figured, okay, he's late, he hasn't called, but he'll be home. Certainly, I think this is, again, you know, with the families, you know, at home, uh, watching television, they're looking at the hour, and Jerome hasn't showed up, so we started to worry. The, the hour started getting into the late hours. Now he's 18 at the time? He's 18 years old. He's a young man and certainly finished school, and mm -hmm. so he's out and about, and so we figured, well, he may be staying a little late, watching a film, movie, playing a game, and you know, on television, or just hanging out with friends. So Can I see a, this picture of him? I know you certainly. Had, when he graduated from high school. Oh, here. this is Jerome here. This is a wonderful shot uh, with uh, with yeah. him, and so we're, we're very proud and sure. excited for him, just like any parent, you know, see their child meet their goals in life, and certainly looking, mm -hmm. he was looking forward to, to many opportunities right. after school, so this was, uh, this was great. Every time I see this picture, I'm it's very proud picture. to see he was a handsome young man. You bet. So then what happened? Well, we, uh, we knew that the hour was getting long and it was already into the midnight hour. So we were just kind of, again, getting ready for bed and we decided, well, you know, he'll be coming in. So we left the front door unlocked and we went to bed. Mm 
and we got up the next morning and certainly I, before I left to work I, I went down to his room and uh, certainly he wasn't there and so I told my wife well when I come back from what I needed to do I had a half a day so I said when I come back I'll, I'll call his friends and find out where he's at he might have stayed overnight at somebody's right, house right. didn't call sure. you know so it's typical to us as a teenager, mm -hmm. wouldn't call home and just, well, you know. Mm -hmm. So that following day, we didn't hear anything. So we started calling his friends and asking him, have you seen Jerome? And nobody seemed to know uh, where his whereabouts was. It began more that weekend where Saturday, Sunday went by and and uh, certainly now it's, you know, according to uh, officials and the law, they don't report any missing to anyone, whether elderly or youth, until after 72 hours. Then it becomes official. So 72 hours is the normal. You're on your own. You're, right. Yeah, you're on your own. Police department says, well, we got to wait till their 72 hours have gone by. As you well know, Rose, anything can happen in 72 hours. It could happen within the first hour. And that's the critical time for um, a lot of families. If there is someone who has not arrived in a time frame where they should, from school, from, uh, from the mall, or from friend's house, mm -hmm. that's the critical time. But officials look at it as 72 hours to us means, you know, he could be anywhere, she could be anywhere, and he's probably with friends or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's a critical time. So 72 hours had gone by. We made our official call to the local uh, uh, police department, and we were told that uh, uh, you know that they would take the report, but because he was an 18-year-old, he was a teenager. Uh, likely, they would say he was probably uh, in Fresno, possibly in Sacramento with a girlfriend. Maybe he's partying, and you know, and and the last. Uh, conversation with MP, which means missing persons, the person that, uh, that took the call, uh, actually just kind of gave me the nonchalant, well, if you hear from him, give me a call. Uh -huh. And that, that in itself has been documented. And so we decided on our own. Jerome, because you knew his characteristics, and sure. it's not something he would normally right. do. And I think it just was just like any other family. You know your children, mm -hmm. you know your, your loved ones, and even with elderly, they tend to uh, there's been many cases documented where elderly have wandered off just maybe right, just right. To, to go to the park and sit on a bench. They've somehow wandered off and something could happen to right. them, you know, medication or they just got lost or someone, you know, uh, approached them and something happened. So. so if he had been 17, they would have done something? As a possibility, but, maybe but not. again, that's, uh, you know, we don't know. Yeah. We don't know. So we, we, we started after, after the 72 hours, we started to uh, create our own flyers with Jerome's photo. And we started to put them out in the, in the community first to ask the stores, can you put it up? Has anyone seen Jerome? Was the community helpful? Uh, it was kind of really uh, touch and go. Some stores said, we don't like that stuff but on our window. Did neighbors come help? I didn't get any help really from the community, from the law enforcement officials, anyone. It was just wow. me and my family, family getting flyers out, whether we put them on the, the uh, uh, telephone poles or in, in some stores, again, that uh, okayed it to, to have it there. Some stores said, wait till my manager comes, we might put it in the window. Oh, wow. And how critical it was for us to getting the information out. Uh, but during that time, we were trying our best to, to see if anyone had seen him. Mm -hmm. And so our hours began, our days started to pile up. And so um, uh, at that time, we, we kept asking his friends, get him out there and see if somebody could see him. Well, throughout those days, several people or several so-called friends had come to us and asked us for flyers and they would help us put them up. So we gave them to him. Mm -hmm. And so they, they went about their way and they went to put them on. And days again went by with no, to no avail. There was no phone calls, no nothing. Nobody seen Jerome. Uh, again, with officials, they didn't have anything. They weren't even looking, really. They were just saying, well, we didn't hear anything. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, again, weeks started piling up. We're in the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, again, as I shared with you, during Thanksgiving, while everybody was having Thanksgiving dinner and certainly enjoying the festivities on television, Geraldine and I 
to not even think of making a Thanksgiving dinner because Jerome wasn't with us. Right. So we went out on our own during that day, looking in ravines along the rivers and in the bushes, wherever we can look to see if any anything we could find, you know, not knowing. Walked the canvas, the the, the schools, the neighborhoods, uh, went to friends' house, knocking a door, and there they are having Thanksgiving, and we're asking, mm -hmm. have you seen Jerome? And they had no knowledge. So, you know, even our Thanksgiving was really kind of uh, uh, very sad, sure. very sad. You know, again, right after Thanksgiving, uh, friends. By now, this is what? week and a half two weeks yeah we're already into two weeks you know he was uh, he, he was actually went missing uh, November 16th so we're already through Thanksgiving we're panicking now we're more of the mm -hmm. uh, panic I'm sure every day was oh yeah more of a panic. Uh, tremendous uh, pressure I mean I mean you know it's just not knowing where your child's at or uh, I mean it, it's devastating you know when when you don't you know you can't sleep at night you can't lay down you know feel safe to lay down now I got to lay down mm -hmm. uh, my child's not home I, I couldn't lay down uh, I mean it was just so nervousness you know mm -hmm. so I'd go out in the middle of the night while my my wife lay down and I'd go look on my own and come back and sometimes I wouldn't go to bed for two days looking for him so it was pretty pretty hard on us oh, I can understand that. You know, so throughout that time, uh, it was leading into uh, 26 days. During, those, oh the, during that time, the same uh, young men that were helping us uh, look for him got a chance to come back another time and asked us for more flyers, so we gave it to them. And they went out and put some more up. So we figured, well, these were his friends helping out. Well, on uh, December 11th, Rose, uh, by 11.30 at night, we received an uh, anonymous tip. Caller had made uh, an attempt to contact us, and um, the caller had repeated several times to me, if you want to find Jerome, he was buried in the park. So... Was there a park close by your oh house? Oh, yes. There was a, a park about one block from our house. It was undeveloped at the time. It was, uh, uh, it's, it's half named as Paul Weston Park. Uh, there's a part at that time the the park wasn't developed yet. There was segments of uh, an undeveloped uh, area, it had a ditch in it, and it was just a rough area. And so about 11:35, I got the first call, and I got up and I told Geraldine, you know, somebody said go to the park, and she was kind of stunned. Uh, who would call? I said I have no idea who called. So we started to get dressed, and, and the phone rang again. So I picked it up, and uh, again, the anonymous caller said, if you want to find Jerome, go to the park. Wow. He's buried in the park. So at that time, you know, PD had already uh, uh, monitored our telephones and stuff. So, so they, they heard the call, too? Oh, then? yeah, they heard the call. And they didn't go out there? No, they came to my house. They didn't go to the park. They came to my house. They came inside my house. There were about six officers. And we were getting dressed, we are putting the jackets on, or getting a flashlight, got my, my uh, uh, you know, of course, our, our pet dog, and we got messy together, and we said, we're going to the park. PD says, no, we'll go to the park and look, you stay here. And i really be honest with you, I said, I've had enough of you not looking for him. I'm going myself. So we left them there, and as on the way out. They didn't out, go out there, too? Well, they came later, but, but we they, left them. <laughs> We left them there in the house, and actually, before I walked out the door, I actually told them, make sure you, you know, shut the front door when you leave, wow. because they were setting up equipment or whatever, you know. Uh, I don't know what they were doing. I was going to the park. So me and my wife and, and my dog, we drove one block uh, from our residence uh, over to, an un the un again, the undeveloped area. We parked our truck, and we started to wander the, the park. I, I really feel that, uh, you know, officials being so lackluster and, and unprofessional and, uh, you know, uh, understanding when someone's gone missing, there's a sense of urgency. And, you know, we, we as taxpayers, you know, and, and certainly uh, know that it's there, they're there to protect and serve the community, and they are servants of the community. And they're there to help us. And we really felt that they kind of just sat back and waited until something <laughs> happened before they reacted. And if yeah. it was their child? 
Oh, you I bet. Mean, you know, I, I just can't child. imagine them thinking that or ignoring something like that. It's just it's unbelievable. It is. It is unbelievable. So we went out to the park. We began walking around Rose, and um, uh, of course, I I I um, come to an area. I lit a cigarette. Uh, I quit smoking <laughs> for a while, and, and I just been so nervous. I lit a cigarette, and I called out Jerome. I said, "Okay, Jerome, Dad's here." Uh, I turned to my right, and I looked down, and Jerry and I saw this. A makeshift grave and so we jumped down into the ditch and with our bare hands we started to remove the tumbleweeds and the dirt and we actually uh, started unmoving the earth and uh, we found Jerome <sighs> wow. so we we dug him up ourselves in a sense <coughs> And I, I think you told me earlier that you you asked your wife to go call the police at that sure. time to come out. Uh, when when we found Jerome, uh, I asked Jerry. You know, we sat there for a few minutes, so we we knew it was Jerome. Mm -hmm. But again, you're looking at someone who's laid out there for 26 days. So I knew in my heart that was my boy, and uh, Jerry knew that. So I asked her, leave, take the dog, go find those cops. Mm -hmm. Go down there, whatever they needed to do, go find them and bring them here. So while Jerry ran with the dog to go uh, call the police over to where we were at, I sat with my son in my arms, and I remember the, the best part about him in my life. And I can tell you that, you know, as, as anyone known, that he was my son. And I didn't care what he looked like. He was my boy. Mm -hmm. And I remember the, the spirit that was guiding me. It said that I would walk in the light of justice through the grace of God and that the justice light would not turn out on Jerome. And I believed that and I, I, I drew strength from that. And uh, while I was sitting there waiting for the police to come, uh, you know, there's so many things that go through... Uh, your mind, you know, revenge, anger, you know, you wanted to do something to someone who had, who might have done this. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a sense of, you know, very much anger. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it could have been out of control anger at one time, but something came over me. And, and I can tell you uh, that uh, the best part about all that is I remember sitting there with him in my arms and a voice came over in my heart and said, I too lost a son, and who grieves for the father, for I too lost a son. And I remembered in my teachings and upbringings about, you know, Christ Jesus who died on the cross. Mm -hmm. And it was our Creator telling me, I too mm -hmm. lost a son, I know what you're going through. And I believe that's the message He gave to me, who grieves for the father, for he too lost a son. Right. So it was very spiritual for me to know that I was being healed at the same time being devastated. And so I knew there was uh, immediate healing going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so when Jerry came back with the police department and they finally arrived, then all kinds of havoc started. To, uh, they asked me to put him down. and Did I they didn't. ever question you? Yes. Oh, yes. Almost definitely. Really? They asked me to put him down, and then they tried to tell me it wasn't him. And actually, they told me if I didn't put him down, they were going to arrest me oh because I was disturbing evidence. So they actually had us come up from the ditch, and they came, and uh, all of a sudden, a lot of police officers showed up. And next thing I knew, we were hurled into a van and taken downtown to a police department headquarters and interrogated for five hours. Oh, you were? Uh, yes, ma'am. Jerry was separate. She went down the oh hall gosh. to another room. I was taken to another room, and I was questioned, uh, you know, outright. Did you not do this yourself? And did you drum up all this? Didn't you create all this? Did you, didn't you kill your son? And I mean, you know, we're in total shock. We have no clue or idea what they're talking about. But again, as a victim, 
in any case like that, Rose, the uh, first thing officials do is they want to first start the elimination process, and that's really going, making sure they go right to the family and say, you know, they might have did this. When they find that they didn't, then they move on the outer perimeter and, and go from there. So I understood that, that they had to question still, us. Still, what a hard time. You bet. I mean. You bet. And the whole time while they were questioning us, I had Jerome still on my arms and my hands, you know. And I was totally in shock and didn't even know that that I was smelling him and mm -hmm. sitting there and being questioned and drilled and questioned and drilled. And yet, there are my hands with, his, with, with him on. Wow. You know? So how did the investigation ensue after that? Well, it was really odd because while we were there for five minutes, I, I, I gather, because we don't know what they did at the park or what was going on because they had us downtown. When we came out of that five-hour interrogation, they brought us back down the hall. It must have convinced them that we had nothing to do with it because they were now taking us back to the park. Mm -hmm. At that time, I noticed through a glass window they had four youth already standing in that, in that uh, waiting area. So I asked them, well, you know, are these somebody of interest? And they said, most definitely, these are the boys who did this to your son. So they had already arrested them. Now, you recognized... I recognized Roy Blank. And he was the boy that had offered to pass out flyers. Or yes, you said there him was... and uh, Nick Langston. Yeah, they had come to our house and asked us to pass out flyers. And we gave them to them. And they, they not only came once, they came twice. How did they get them so quickly? What led them to these boys? I, I believe that they had some sense that these were the last to uh, see Jerome. Uh, they had, uh, and it was interesting learning through all the trials, we learned through their investigation that they had kept saying, we left Jerome in the park. The last time you seen Jerome, we left him in the park. They didn't say he did anything to him. They just said, we left them. We left Jerome in the park. So with their investigation, uh, and uh, certainly coming up with what they did, they arrested those four youth. Was it one of them that called? No, I was not. It wasn't? No. So somebody else knew about it as well. Yeah, it took them about four months later to determine that because, again, a process, uh, a procedure that uh, they had to go through for Pacific Bell to release uh, phone records for uh, them to track down where that call came from. Even though we have a caller ID, it's still, you know, Pacific Bell in, in this particular case would to release that information being a private caller. As uh, we know we have now that technology today on our telephone, we can tell where the call originates from. But seven years ago, we weren't that, I guess, advanced. Mm -hmm. So Pacific Bell had to release that information, but again, it took four months for us to identify who the caller was. Right. And then you had the trials. Uh, yeah, we, we actually, you know, felt that uh, they were, uh, were going to be charged with uh, murder of my son, first degree murder. So we felt confident DA was going to go forth with that, and that was our impression. And so, you know, we were attending the court hearings and we were hoping, to, you know, again, just like any uh, homicide victim, you want to get you know, uh, those involved, uh, put behind bars, put behind jail, and uh, certainly, you know, you take a life, your life should be taken from society. Uh, many a times people have asked me about the death penalty and what I believe in it. Uh, uh, I more or less will tell you, Rose, that if you take someone's life, I believe your life should be taken out of society and those opportunities to be able to be a part of society and, and bringing up your own family or having a house and cars or, you know, children to go to school. Your life should be behind bars for the rest of your life. But that's what I believe in. Mm -hmm. It's not really what justice really puts out. Because as we know, in many cases, justice sometimes is served in um, uh, half a sentence. Somebody could be sentenced 25 to life and be out on parole in less than 20 years. That's right. So what happened? Well, we went to trial. 
we, we thought we were going somewhere. These are again a, a youth that were under the age of 16, except for uh, Nick were. Langston. No, only one. Okay. Nick Langston was 18. Okay. So we could, at that time, we could only say his name in being involved, uh, even with the newspaper. Let me ask you this. As I'm sure this is hard to come up with an answer, but why? Why would these four boys do this? There were kids, too. You know, we learned this through trial, and uh, we had the same question. Why, do you, mm -hmm. why did you kill my boy? And it took us to going through these trials to understand when the DA asked them on the witness stand, why did you kill Jerome? So what I'm about to tell you is actually in the testimony, in the court documents, what they said, what they did. And all four of them in four different trials said the same thing. And so when my boy was leaving uh, his girlfriend's home and he was headed home through the park, he had stopped and seen them there. And he was talking to them about, again, um, uh, his spiritual walk. These boys uh, were Gothic children. These are the ones that paint their hair black, fingernails, and they are involved in satanic or rituals and worship, and they burn the cross, and they listen to the Marilyn Manson music that is very much influenced in that area. So Jay, uh, as we know him as Jay, we called him Jay all the time, just a letter J, he liked that. Uh, and I'll refer to that a few times during this interview, but Jerome mm -hmm. had stopped and he was talking with them and had told them if they kept doing what they were doing, that they weren't going to be the chosen ones. Well, that incited the fight between them and according to their testimony, Jerome took one punch, fell and hit his head. And we all know that was not the truth. But uh, that was their interpretation of what happened. We never got any further any more out of them to what really, what is the truth. But they did all testify and had the same story. That Jerome had stopped and talked to them and said, if they continue doing what they're doing, they weren't going to be the chosen ones. And he meant more of those who walk in light of our Creator, you know. This is really graphic, but that wasn't the case, right? He didn't just hit his head. You saw the condition of the oh, we, we, you know, it, it's, um, it's horrific when you find your, your loved one, the way we found Jerome. But we too had to go to the coroner's office mm -hmm. to do the final identification of my boy. We had to go to the funeral home to make those plans and preparation for him. And so Geraldine and I had to see him more than once in finding him that way. So yes, his, his uh, condition was not as what they said. Jerome sustained a, a, a multi-skull uh, fracture, which is a, as reported in the death certificate as blunt trauma to the head. He received a fractured cheekbone, a broken nose, uh, three fractures to the upper jaw, one fracture to the lower jaw. He received a broken neck as well as the Adam Apple area where he, you know, of course has the wind to breathe through. And um, uh, he was pretty much a, a beaten man. And this was in the court report? Yes, ma'am. Came out in the uh, coroner's uh, report, the Department of Justice pathology report and the Livermore Labs report of the condition of my son's body when, when we found him. Hey, you, you mentioned something earlier, there were four trials. Yes, ma'am. So you had to go through this each time yes. with each of these individuals, and what was the outcome of those? Well, you know, Rose, there are so many things that have gone on through the trial that, you know, changed things, being that they were uh, underage. You know, I was being tried as a juvenile for murder, tried as young adult as murder or tried as adult as murder. And I think the DA was struggling with that because of the age. We're experiencing that more and more in society today where our youth are now, being at the age of that 14, 15, 16 years old, are, are committing these, these crimes. These, uh, you know, they're, they're, they are felonies. When mm -hmm. you shoot someone, stab someone, or beat someone to death and you're 14 years old, you're a youth. 
And so our society is now starting to almost, you know, uh, it's almost like we're, we're, we're being immune to it. We're already kind of already being numb to it because it's happening rapidly and more and more. These young folks are doing these type of crimes. And uh, whether they're influenced by alcohol or drugs, it's still, it's a crime to, right. to kill someone. So the DA, the uh, district attorney's offices are struggling with pre presenting those cases in court. It's a young children killing. Children, children, children killing children. Exactly. So the DA struggling with the law. What does the law say? The law says, well, they're just children. But guess what? Murder is murder. That's right. There's no color in murder. You know, there's no ethnic group divided and sliced and diced like a piece of pie. Murder is murder. You know, there's no color. You know, so we're struggling with that in these trials where they didn't know if we were going to go juvenile court. And we've gone through that process until all of a sudden the juvenile DA says, well, they changed the procedure. Now we're going to take, charge them as adults. So it slows the process up. It now puts it on a calendar year for a judge to look at and says, oh, okay, now I've got to take this case. And you have four of these. So now the DA decided to take all these young kids on and try them as adults. So through that process, you have one, one, one of the youths uh, pled, pled the Fifth Amendment, had a lawyer and pled the Fifth Amendment. Well, then we all know what the Fifth Amendment is. You cannot say anything that would be against you in any court of law. Uh, the other youth, uh, you know, had gone to court. They made deals behind closed doors. Next thing you know, oh, well, we're going to charge them with manslaughter. Manslaughter as a probation uh, response to them is saying, well, he's underage. We'll put him on a five-year probation for murder and manslaughter. So they made that decision. And so two out of the four got five years probation for being underage. Probation. Probation. Probation, and they charged him with manslaughter. The other two, Nick Langston got five years, and now he's out. Uh, Roy Blank is is uh, still in prison. He won't get out till 2013. Okay. Wow. So that's what we are faced with, you know. So we've already experienced the other two being out, uh, and especially in our community, they've walked in front of me, they've cursed me out, laughed at me. And yet we as, again, uh, victims, being victims of homicide, we cannot do anything about that. That's the way the court uh, operates. You know, they make a judgment and they're stuck with it. So the deal's behind closed doors. So there wasn't doors. a jury trial? Yeah, there was. They, but they cut a deal. They, they, they cut a deal. And I think a lot of families nowadays, Rose, are dealing with that, especially with the cost uh, and economic uh, situations as, as stricken in our, our societies. Uh, victims now are spending a lot of time, instead of in court with trial, like we see on television, some of the shows, and if you remember going back to the Perry Mason days mm -hmm. where you had that drama of the, the lawyer pressing the issue, getting the charge, right. and, and putting someone behind bars for murder. Nowadays, it's let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. And it's because our prisons are full. They tell us the prisons are full. We cannot afford to keep putting more of these people in prison because you and I both know as taxpayers, we pay for those things. So that, I think that's strickening our state right now. And Governor Schwarzenegger is, is really you know, stuck in that issue. You know, between nonviolent offenders versus violent offenders, he's willing to release nonviolent offenders. That's so, pretty violent, though. Well, uh, being charged with manslaughter. I need to ask you, what race were they, the boys? Uh, I can only tell you from what, you know, I think at the time, without really looking into that, I think they were a uh, uh, white Caucasian They were group. white. Mm -hmm. You think it had anything to do with being a native boy that was killed by white kids, and the white kids get more of a break because it is a native? I think it's, it's, you know, so much with the minorities, Rose. Uh, you see that so often, you know. 72% uh, of uh, those inmates in, in prison mm -hmm. are minorities. Uh, Any time, and, and I've said this to them, if it was four Indians who killed a white boy, 
we wouldn't have a trial. We would have had an execution That's true. and would have hung them. That's true. But I have four white boys who killed a, a Native American and we're making a deal. Yeah. We're making a deal. And uh, it makes it hard to, to understand justice in that way. So we've tried to... Well, I don't uh, see that as justice. No. Because it isn't. No. It isn't. No. So how is a family... You've gotten a lot of strength from Jerome. Mm -hmm. You move on, and you've you've helped. You've done so much for other families to try and get laws changed, to try and get mental health for people. And how, how you know how do you help other families cope? Well, I think you know from the very beginning when we lost Jerome is that we wanted to do something very positive in light of the negativity that uh, that's really struck us hard. Mm -hmm. We've already have enough hatred in our society, uh, uh, enough betrayal in our society, mm -hmm. and we wanted to do something very positive to show our strength and healing. And uh, I think a lot of people don't realize the, or understand our Native uh, culture. When we say we lift our prayers up to the Creator, we're healing. And we heal differently than most people view us as, but we heal in some way. It may not be immediate resolve. It might not come, uh, you know, in a time frame where they say to you, when are you going to get over it, Mr. Muniz? You know, it's been five years, you know. Uh, there is no getting over because you have to get through it first. And uh, when people don't understand that part where they say, you know, well, haven't you gone over, you know, and beyond past doing all that. I mean, come on, you know, it's, you hear that a lot, you know, you should already, you know, gone, your son's been gone, you know, they, they're, they're confused themselves when they talk to me. But I think as natives, we find a way to continue to keep a, a, a living memorial uh, with them because we don't look at them as they're just gone. Right. We know that they, they live with us in our spirit. So even in, in, in Jerome's uh, passing, you know, we, we use the term when people bury their loved ones, they have born and they died. Well, we felt very clear about this whole thing, that knowing that if you're going to turn something very positive into something neg negative, uh, Jerome was born, but he was also reborn onto our Creator. Yeah. So it gave us life to know that he's reborn. He has a spiritual life that we need to, to honor because of his, uh, his lifespan, you know, 18 years. It's still to us very short in his life, but yet, uh, as Jerry had said uh, in an interview, she said, we thank God for the season that he has given us in 18 mm -hmm. years. And it was a season, and, and we have to be blessed with that. So, so things started to kind of happen right away. It was, it was right in January, uh, uh, oh, two. And I was concerned for the safety and well-being for our community with that ditch where Jerome was at. People were going out and putting crosses out there and putting flowers and, you know, bouquets and stuff. And we didn't want where we found Jerome to turn into a grave site. And the public has their way of wanting to honor or right. at least bring some homage to what happened. So we decided that we wanted to get involved in that uh, phase two project and said, well, why not turn it into a nice park? And so we began to work with city uh, managers, the parks and rec department. So I requested that the first, number one, for the safety and well-being for our children and community, that the ditch that Jerome was found in be covered up. And they came right away with my request. I, I think I faxed it at 9 o'clock in the morning by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Rose. They had wow. the earth movers there. And I think they honored that with Jerome. They said, That's well, nice. let's just, you know, let's not linger here about what happened to him here. Let's start moving towards what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, we started working with the city, and they included me onto the planning commission of the park and the designer. I met with the designer. He's a wonderful individual. And we began our healing process really then because people ask us, how can you go back to the same park your son was murdered in? And you're out there pouring concrete and planting trees and putting up. Because you know his lighting. spirit's there. He's you got there, it. yeah. And to us, it was healing. It was our way of healing, to go back and to plant, you know, a, a, a tree, mm -hmm. and see that now, even now, after seven years, mm -hmm. it's growing beautiful. So, 
Uh, so the city felt very, very confident in us and um, uh, that we were going in the right direction with Jerome. And so they decided to say, well, you know, you're helping build this park. Why don't we dedicate a site to him and, and, and put an art? We're going to have an art design out here anyway. So let's make it drones, you know. Yeah. So we said, wow, this is great. So it just started from there. We wanted to try to heal in some way. And so I encourage um, a lot of our, our families that have lost loved ones to find some way of healing. And the only way really is the beginning of healing is within your loss. How are you, you know? connected with other groups? You mentioned uh, we became, um, you know, we became familiar with some of the uh, cases that were already profiled. Of course, uh, we were Northern California's top story for, uh, for a while, and uh, uh, several associates that, of mine came along, and certainly we met uh, Sue Levy and uh, uh, began talking with her, and she kind of brought us under the umbrella of Wings of Protection. So it was an advocate group to, to talking with uh, other victims and families and, you know, working with them and, and the needs that they have and, and the candlelight vigils that they would have, you know, mm -hmm. that they, they needed to find some healing in. So we fell under them. We, we kind of mm -hmm. started working with them and developing this organization with them. So it was a really, uh, it was a good experience. And you found solace in, I guess, sharing the experience with someone who could actually say, they felt it too because their child or lost a, mm -hmm. lost a loved one. Well, I think uh, one thing I, I think you can really find it interesting is that when another victim meets another victim, that eye contact, that parent look and, and on the face is that they find some, somebody that says, somebody understands me now. Because when you go down to the Victims Witness Program of the DA's office, um, one of their programs really is, is about hiring professionals to come in, the ones that have the degrees and stuff and how they will handle or deal mm -hmm. with victims. And they're not one to be a victim because they would be too biased if they were right, victims. Right. So uh, those folks, then they tell you, oh, I understand what you're going through. They really don't. Right. So the advocate groups and, and stuff like that, Wings of Protection, the San Joaquin County Victims of Violent Crime, uh, Citizens Against Homicide, uh, Crime Victims United groups that I'm familiar with statewide, they're the groups of actual victim families that are working together trying to find some resolve into justice, uh, some laws uh, changed in legislation. And so when you talk with them, you can see eye to eye. There's some healing going on because they understand. Sure. Now, you brought some pictures that we'd like to share from when they did the dedication of sure. the, um, the statue that sure. you had built in the, the park. Monument, yeah. The monument. Let's take a look at those and <coughs> kind of explain what we're looking at here. Now, this is where? Well, this is where we're at. Uh, every year they have the uh, Victims March on the Capitol Rose, and each year we go out and, and uh, gather together there. I had the opportunity in 2006 to be a guest speaker there at the, the Capitol, and I got to speak with, uh, you know, of course, Governor Schwarzenegger. And uh, as you can see that uh, I was actually there uh, as a guest speaker and, and speaking about victims' rights and what needs to be done and the changes. Uh, and of course, you this know, is this, like the, the Capitol steps. Yes, this is right the outside the Capitol in Sacramento, and uh, I had the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, most, most, uh, uh, I, I don't know as you say it's probably one of the best opportunities anyone could have. I had a chance to speak with him. Um, here's the uh, dedication site that we sent some photos down. This is Jerome's uh, dedicated site. This is, this is uh, the park itself. This is the park itself. This oh, was right beautiful. when we uh, set it down. This is basalt. It's polished. It has Jerome uh, saxophone on, on the front part. Um, Jerome's plaque is on there. Oh, yeah. This is the plaque that's up at the federal building, the CCPOA up in Sacramento, with the flag that accompanied that. It was flown at the White House in Washington, D.C. Oh. And as you can oh, see yeah. there, there's uh, the flag that's being folded in honor of Jerome. That flew at our nation's capital. Uh, Congressman uh, wow. Richard Pombo and Dennis Cardoza requested. And of course, Geraldine and I are there at the CCPOA building and stuff. But this flag was dedicated for all victims of violent crime for the state of California, and anyone could walk into the lobby and, and, and see that uh, for oh, victims. That's beautiful. 
thought we had a picture of Jerome there. But we'll show that a little bit later. Yeah. So they flew the flag. Oh, there he is right there on the screen. There's That's Jerome. That's beautiful. And he was a saxophone player. I see oh, the saxophone you bet. there. Yeah, and the sax is used as yeah. a J for Jerome Joseph. It's just uh -huh. been, you know, uh, certainly a lot of people love his music still to this day. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. So where do you go from here? Well, I think, you know, with, uh, with all the uh, uh, positive things that have happened for Jerome, we do have a trust fund uh, in the school adjacent to where Jerome was found. And that trust fund is to help children who cannot afford an instrument can now play oh, an instrument wonderful. under Jerome's trust fund. So we fund that each year to make sure that there's enough money there to help buy instruments so uh, children that's that are beautiful. interested in music. And uh, so the Unified School District up there in Manteca uh, in San Joaquin has honored uh, Geraldine and I by having our portraits painted in the school. Really? Uh, and we have a music department for Jerome, so it's been exciting ah. for the school to see. And we see a lot of kids out in the community. They see and they see me, and they go, "I know who you are. <laughs> You're Mr. Munez." And you know, he gave us, and they would tell us in the street or in the store, "Thank you for our instruments." You know, ah. but it's just a wonderful feeling to see that the school has adopted that uh, trust fund in, in honor of Jerome. So mm -hmm. we're excited for that. Um, you know, to have the park, to have the school doing that, you know, and then the flag, of course, and then the dedication for that. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's really um, self-evident in itself uh, to know that we've done something very positive and, and tried to move forward in, in helping other victims. But when you say, where do we go from here, I, I think the, the important thing is that uh, Families uh, find uh, an avenue of uh, and connect, mm -hmm. connect to. Um, it sounds like that's very important. Yeah. To have that connection with other people who've experienced mm -hmm. similar loss. Right. And having the the mental health um, services that I think are not often available to Native people or people in general who have this kind of experience and trauma in their lives and trying to deal with it. Well, again, that's one of the issues that we're bringing up uh, uh, up at the Capitol with the governor's office and, of course, uh, several of the advocate groups as well, is that mental health has a, a lot of um, uh, programs available in our community. But one of the things I think it's hard for them, with, and they're, of course, they're over, uh, uh, you know, uh, populated with so many people mm -hmm. coming in with so many issues and certainly maybe understaffed a lot to cover that. But I think, you know, what we are campaigning for is that there should be uh, funding uh, set aside from the state to, to help victims right. who are going through some mental health issues and, uh, and, and certainly that is the case because you know, as I sit here, I can tell you that we certainly need those type of services as well because it's not just for a temporary situation, it's long term because mm -hmm. you have to deal with these things and who knows what might happen 20 years from now and how the cause and effect of something like this has on you. And sometimes it's in burst maybe or just short term right now as uh, again being evaluated, you don't know, you don't know. But we're asking the state to kind of look at it in that, in that area to try to bring some, some funding into that area for, mm -hmm. for, for folks. Because we're, we're finding a lot, too, that families are not getting that services, they're not getting that help, or uh, don't have an avenue there. Therefore, we're finding a lot that are committing suicide. They're, they're, they're going to drugs or alcohol mm -hmm. because it's hard to deal with. And some have that tolerance to, to hang in, and, and some have that pain that they can hold on to. But not everybody's the right. same. So, uh, yeah, it does lead to some, some, some terrible things even after. I mean, especially when a family finds their loved one, you know. As bad uh, as it is in a lot of, I, and I know some high profile cases, where they receive the phone call or the knock on right. the door of their loved one. And that's devastating in itself, you know, to hear about, you know, that you lost one, um, especially a family I know that they were at work and, you know, they, they come home after work having a great day and they pull up to their home and their fire department's there and you're going, what's going on? Your house is burning, you know, what, what happened? Mm -hmm. 
you know, your first thoughts, why is my house burning? And come to find out her, her husband had uh, committed suicide, set himself on fire mm -hmm. because he couldn't deal with the situation anymore. So now there's more devastation mm -hmm. in the family, and so that puts more mental stress and, and pressure on the family especially uh, spouses, you know, they're the ones who are trying to hold the family together with the siblings. Mm -hmm. So we've asked to stay, we've asked and have many meetings with them and, and certainly it's, it's a concern, but it's certainly not the most concern. Because again, uh, you know, with legislation, changing the laws, getting funding today, it's just, it's, it's enormous as far it's as uphill. not having any. They, they more or less that's all you hear, layoffs and and certainly no, nobody having anything. And you mentioned people even struggle with the burial part. Oh, certainly. You know, I mean, you, you know, you were able to provide for your son and, mm -hmm. you know, we have a lot of mainly cremation, right. the native community, but some people can't. Bury well, there, them. yeah, certainly, Rose, there are a lot of families who are not prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly you, you, you see that advertisement and certainly you try to plan ahead. You try to plan for that in your life, you know. We all want to have a, a plan. And we plan for a funeral. We plan to say, oh, I want to put some money aside so I have a nice funeral or whatever. But there are some families who can't afford to plan ahead. So they're stricken right off the bat with the cost and, and stuff of, of having to pay for a, a funeral. And I know some families that not only it happened once, but twice and sometimes wow. three times right in within months that they've lost a loved one right in the immediate family. So you can imagine enormous cost that they would have to pay for services to be provided for, you know, again, funeral services, church services, and of course a burial plot. So, you know, this is not uh, something that's, uh, you know, affordable anymore. It's very expensive these days to have a funeral. Well, Richard, I want to thank you for joining us and sharing your story. We have a couple minutes left. Can you share something with our audience who may be going through a similar experience? Well, I, I just know that um, the healing process is going to take a long time for my family, for Geraldine and Ty, Nathan and Nicole, and, and certainly Josh. And I think that is still stricken us a little bit. but. You know, we have the support of our Native uh, brothers and warriors and our sisters in, in our community. And being out there playing uh, music, I am a flute player. I think I try to play my flute and honor my son, and I hope the audience sees that my music is to carry on Jerome. But I think, you know, we, we know it's going to be a while. It's going to be a while for us to really find some peace and understanding of why these things happen. But I think the Creator has blessed us in many ways, and, and it's through people, and, and especially Jerome. Jerome is, is, is being sought after he's even He's the guiding after. light there. He's a guiding he light, is. and he's guiding us so much, so we're, we're grateful for that. I want to thank you for being here you bet. and sharing your story. And I just wish your family all the best. This is for oh. you. Oh, thank you. Oh. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for joining us. Children.